Heartwood Hotel, Chapter 3. Trouble with Tilly. Mona followed Giles away from the party and back into the lobby to a candlelit staircase near the stone fireplace. She could see that it went up and down many floors. Come, come, the lizard gestured to her. Tilly will be in the kitchen. The lizard led her down to the floor below and along to the end of the hallway. Giles pushed open a swinging door to reveal a smaller, a room smaller than neither the lobby or the ballroom, but still bigger than Mona's old home. A kind of medium. The kitchen was filled with even more delicious smells than the ballroom. Baskets of nuts and berries hung from roots on the ceiling over a long table that was cluttered with pots and bowls, spoons and serving trays. Cupboards were dug into the dirt walls. Some were open, showing stacked dishes and jars of dried seeds and herbs of all kinds. A sink, made from a large shell, was filled with dirty pots and pans. There was a fireplace in the corner, and over it hung a pot, bubbling with an acorn mash. You really need to visualize when hearing a novel, and I want you to do that today because it's explaining some new places and new rooms. So I really hope you created a picture in your mind there. I'll repeat some things. Okay, if you have to close your eyes and think about um, what this might look like. Cupboards were dug into the dirt. A sink was made from a large shell. And there was a fireplace in the corner with a uh, pot hanging over top of it. So what room in the house do you think this might be? What room does it describe? It's got cupboards, a sink got food. Hey, this is the kitchen, right? So keep keep picturing that setting in your mind. You don't want to just hear me speaking words. Um, it's going to make a lot more sense if you've got the setting in your mind and when I'm speaking the words, it's adding to the story. A plump porcupine was stirring the mash with a particularly long quill. She wasn't alone. A red furred squirrel with a very bushy tail, sat at the table, nibbling at giant puffy cake. Don't poke your paws into everything, Tilly dear, chided the porcupine. There's got to be enough for Mr. Hartwood. You know how hungry he gets after a party. Yes, Mrs. Prickles, the squirrel reluctantly pushed the dishes away. But after the party, that's when I have to clean up. I won't get a chance to eat anything. I'll set aside some seed cakes for you, dear. I like acorn souffle better, muttered the squirrel, just loud enough to be heard. Souffle, that must be a name for the puffy cake, thought Mona. It's for the guests, you know that, replied the porcupine, turning around and shaking her stirring quill at the squirrel, only to catch sight of Giles and Mona. What's this, Giles? Who have you brought us? Not a guest, surely. Of course not, said Giles, as though he was offended. She's a new maid, Mona. Mona, this is Mrs. Prickles, our cook. Hello, dearie, said the porcupine. And this, continued Giles, gesturing towards the squirrel, is Tilly. Mona stuck out her paw, but Tilly didn't take it. Her tail bristled instead. New maid? Just for the night, continued Jill, Giles. She will help you clean up after the party. In any case, they're Mr. Hartwood's orders, not mine. He wants you to help her find the brushes and the apron. A mouse? help? Mice are too small to be maids. Tilly's tail bristled up even more, bigger than her body. And she can't help anyone clean anything. Why, she's just tracking in more mud. Oh, Tilly's not very nice. Your problem, not mine, said Giles, heading out of the kitchen, but not before the porcupine said. If you're going back upstairs, you might as well bring up the souffle before Tilly eats it all. I'm the front desk lizard. It's not my job to serve food, grumped Giles. But he took the souffle anyway, and with that, disappeared. Tilly didn't even protest the departure of her favorite dish. She was still glaring at Mona with such ferocity that Mona couldn't help but tremble. Mona looked down. Her paws were still very dirty. It was the storm, she muttered. Oh, dear, dear, you poor thing, gushed Miss Prickles. Now here, where is a nice rag? The porcupine opened the cupboard and under the sink and rummaged through it. She pulled out a rag that looked like it was made of soft bark. She handed it to Mona, who quickly rubbed her paws and even her tail. There, that's better, isn't it, dearie? Mona, right? Mona nodded, handing back the towel. 
Such a sweet name for a sweet little thing, you know. I think I've got a bit of my cheese crumble left. Would you like a nibble? It's a favorite of our mice guests. At this, Tilly broke in. No time for eating. The party will be over soon, and now I have more work to do showing her around. Oh, Tilly, hush, hush, said Miss Brickles. Show a little sympathy. I think you would, considering... Tilly went completely silent. There was a long pause, and Miss Prickles didn't say anything else, except for, Oh, Tilly, it's been a long day for all of us, hasn't it? Yes, Miss Prickles, said Tilly, finally. Miss Prickles turned to Mona and explained, Mrs. Higgins, our housekeeper, is sick with a cold, and it's meant double the work. And with a party going on, well, it's not easy to keep a hotel this size running, that's for certain. I can usually do it by myself just fine, except for this feast, replied Tilly with a hump. Then she looked at Mona again and sighed, Well, we'd better get an apron on you. You can have the crumble later, dearie, Miss Prickles said to Mona, as Mona once again was led away. After dropping off her suitcase in Tilly's room, I guess you'll have to share with me, she said. They passed more rooms and hallways and at last reached a storage room where Tilly dug out a broom, dustpan, and apron. The apron was much too big, so Mona wrapped the string around her waist several times before tying them. It was so long she hoped she wouldn't trip on it. Do I need a key? asked Mona, pointing to the one Tilly had around her neck. After all, Giles had been wearing one, and Mr. Hartwood had lots. Ha! replied Tilly. You're only working for the night. Keys are for proper staff like me. You'll just be cleaning the ballroom. Just the ballroom, indeed. With only a few guests left, nibbling the last of the buffet, the ballroom was far larger than it had seen before and far messier. Crumbs of seed cakes and bits of mushrooms and acorns dotted the floor. Mona had to sweep up all the crumbs with a broom. A dried dandelion that was turned upside down. Picture that. Like the apron, it was too big for her, but she held the handle down low. She dumped the crumbs in a bucket, even though she was so hungry she wanted to eat them. And there was honey everywhere. Tilly gave her a rag and a nutshell of soapy water, but the honey was very hard to scrub off. It was a long night, especially since nothing Mona did seemed to be good enough for Tilly. Still sticky, she'd say, in between doing her tasks, and she'd make Mona return to the spot and scrub some more. Through it all, the storm raged, the wind rattling and the, shutter, the shutters of the ballroom. Mona was grateful to be inside and warm, despite the hard work. Hard work, but how full of marvels. The bright clusters of elderberries that Tilly took from the ceiling, the instruments on the stage, everything was so magical. And best of all, the sunshiny yellow leaves that Mona helped Tilly arrange in the vases on the table. They looked beautiful. The night ended with a bit of cheese crumble too. So when Mona lay down in Tilly's room on the spare feathers, the most comfortable bed she ever had, Tilly's loud snores didn't bother her. Mona wasn't grumpy. Not at all. When at last the mouse fell asleep, her dreams were filled not with fears and forest, but with the new wondrous wonders of the Hartwood Hotel. Things seem to be looking a little bit up for Mona as we end chapter three. Next chapter is called Pledging a Paw. I wonder what that will be about.